Waves crash against the shore as an aging lighthouse looks on. Wind whips around the few brave tourists who have ventured out here. Despite this island location being in New York State, it's physically closer to Boston than Manhattan, and if you squint through the mist, you might be able to see Rhode Island. So what if I told you we came here on a New York commuter train? You see, the town of Montauk, on Long Island South Fork, is connected to New York City by the Long Island Railroad's Montauk Branch, the longest commuter rail service in the United States, at 118 miles. And last summer, I took a trip to the Big Apple just to ride it. There goes my mega bus, with my charger still on it. That makes two chargers lost to Megabus this summer. Do consider joining my Patreon to help me recover from this. While the longest Montauk trains begin here at Penn Station, most originate at Jamaica Station in Queens, so I headed there on a local electric train. I feel like now would be a good time to take a look at the map, and who better to explain it than native Long Islander Penzi Van 19 Among the 11 branch lines of the busiest commuter railroad in the country, the Montauk branch is undoubtedly the longest in the whole system at 116 miles from Penn Station. Most runs to Montauk usually originate at Jamaica or Long Island City. After Babylon, the line becomes diesel only but still double track to Patrock. After Spionk, the line becomes single track as it enters the Hamptons, the land of tourists and quiet millionaire mansions. And finally, Montauk, the easternmost station in New York State, and known for its lighthouse. Thanks, Penzi fan. Stay tuned to the end of the video for his exclusive face reveal. Wait, what? I didn't agree to that. Anyways, we pick back up at Jamaica Station. This is one of the Long Island Railroad's biggest hubs, with most lines passing through it. Equipment of all sorts was on display during morning rush hour, with trains arriving and departing every couple of minutes. I'd be catching the 818 service to Montauk, and since it was an outbound train during morning rush hour, I figured it wouldn't be too crowded. As it turned out, I was dead wrong. For an outbound train at Jamaica at 8 o'clock in the morning, there are a lot of people on the platform. I guess it's a summer thing. Our train pulled in, led by one of the railroad's iconic DE-30AC locomotives, and made up of Kawasaki C3 bi-level coaches. Unfortunately, there weren't enough of these, and by the time I squeezed onto the train, all the seats were taken up, and I was crammed into a vestibule. Needless to say, this resulted in a less than comfortable ride as we left Queens. From Jamaica, the electrified main line flies over Hillside Maintenance Facility and passes by a lot of MOW equipment before joining the Far Rockway, West Hempstead, and Long Beach branches. There are also a handful of peak trains that go directly from Babylon to Jamaica by bypassing the Babylon branch altogether and using a main line that goes through Mineola and Hicksville, and then the central branch from Bethpage to Babylon in order to ease congestion on the Babylon line. Luckily, this is one of the trains that Caleb is on now. I had hoped that perhaps Babylon would signal the end to my cramped conditions, but when hardly anyone in the vestibule got off, my hopes were dashed. It seems like the summertime weekday crowd was headed to the beach, which meant they would be riding the whole way to the South Fork. This is a good time to remind you that today's journey would come in at just under three hours. Babylon marked the end of the line's electrification, and once we'd left, the ubiquitous third rail was gone. A few stops later at Sayville, the line became single-tracked, and at the next station, Pacho, right? Pachog. Pachog. I can never pronounce things on Long Island. Anyways, here in Pachog, I am joined by Avery. Nice to meet you. Welcome back to Suffolk County. Thank you, thank you. I feel welcomed. Avery is the guy who comments just like tons and tons of facts in every single comment section of every single video. Yes. We made a much more detailed breakdown of the Montauk Line's history and geography on his channel, so go check it out. Where do you get all that information? Uh, let's just say in my family I know as the, uh, the king of useless information. <laughs> useless? After Patchogue, the scenery became wilder and more rural, and we could see more out of the window besides trees as we moved on to the South Fork. As we reach West Hampton, we are officially in the Hamptons. Now you might be thinking to yourself, why are there so many Hamptons? Allow me to explain. When the British sailed out on the east end of Long Island, they named their whaling community. Wait a minute, wait a minute. They were killing whales? Yeah, there are a lot of whaling communities once out in, out in the Hamptons. Uh, they, so they named their first community after the Earl of Southampton, and then the other judges were like, hey, that's a great idea. So they all adopted this Hampton theme, and that thus became the Hamptons. But they were killing classy whales! 
It was here in the Hamptons that a miracle happened. So a lot of people got off in Southampton, so now we finally, finally have seats. Almost at the end of our journey. We, we stood for a long time between Patrick and Sarada. I'm just happy to be uh, finally making out the Montauk by train. I've never done it by train before. Bridgehampton is home to one of the two Kmarts left in the mainland United States, with the other in Miami. There are no Walmarts, no Targets in the Hamptons, so Kmart is there as the affordable everything goods store for those who live there year-round, and you can still buy gift cards. So why isn't Montauk a Hampton? Well, the name Montauk is derived from the Montaukit people who live there. It roughly translates to the Fort Country. The station in Montauk wasn't much to look at, with just a narrow high platform sheltered at one end. The 1942-era station building is preserved as an art gallery, but unfortunately, it was closed when we arrived. So now we're going to catch the bus from here to the Montauk Lighthouse. The only problem is there's no signed bus stop for the 10C, which takes the route from here to there. Apparently, uh, you called the transit agency and they said it comes here, right? Yes, they, they said that even though there is no bus stop sign. Shoot, that's the bus. That's the bus right there. It's over there. Whale watching, you're already doing that. I love how much you love puns. So now we are here at the Montauk Point Lighthouse, which is one of the first public works projects of the U.S. government, correct? It was the first public works project of the U.S. government. It was authorized in 1792 by George Washington himself. This one is 110.5 feet tall, which is still tall and still a prominent structure. Shall we go climb it? We shall. Okay, I'm climbing the lighthouse and it kind of tapers so the corkscrew gets narrower the more you climb. Caution, low headroom. Oh, that poor guy is having a time of it. Oh, I uh, just about smacked my head on that. Oh, that's and then for some reason there's one last little bit. This is the steepest, tiniest cramped staircase I've ever climbed. Okay, it was worth it for this view. So I can climb up to this yellow step. And uh, that's as far as I'm allowed to go. Three sixty degree view. This is incredible. Well worth the fifteen bucks I spent on it. If I ever have a kid, please send this to me. And now I'm going to do something for the first time that a lot of you have probably done before: geocaching. Yeah, it's a uh, it's a high tech treasure hunt game where you use a GPS to find hidden containers with trinkets, a logbook. And the goal of geocaching is to explore the great outdoors, go to locations that you wouldn't have known otherwise if it wasn't for geocaching. So apparently the geode that we're catching is uh, up on these rocks. This is just a cool little beach. You were smart by wearing long pants. He is checking a hint. Excellent. Apparently he found a bison tube. Whatever that is. And here's the log book. It's soggy, huh. but it's neatly tightly rolled. And now we have to find a space for it to, sh to log that we found it. And there's little things like this all over the country, all over the world, right? Yes. There it is, a record of our existence. There we go. So we're back at the station and we have a few minutes to kill. So we're going to check out the art gallery inside the former station head house. It's open. This has a very Montauk vibe. I really like it. So our return train transfers in Spionk. I'm saying that wrong, Aunt. Spionk. Wait, I said that right? Yes. <sighs> but because of that, we're worried that it's going to be a two-car train. And given the abundance of passengers already lined up on the platform, this better not be standing room only again. Fingers crossed it's not. Also, note how narrow this platform is. Like, if you have a whole crush of people getting off the train, this is perhaps a little bit of a squeeze. Bonkers. Yes, absolutely bonkers. No, there's more cars. We're saved. 
look at this. Real seats that are empty. And even there's some forward facing and working ones. announcements. Not every C3 has automated announcements that work. So now we're here at Spionk and we are changing to the local train because this one goes express all the way to Jamaica. And already our train is coming from the Spionk yard. The reason we were taking the local train was because Avery wanted to show me a very special town. Welcome to Patchogue, a great place to live, work, and play. People often have to stereotype that Long Island is nothing but car-oriented suburbs, but Patchogue stands in contrast to this. The town features bike share, good bus service, housing near the station, and a walkable Main Street. When New York Governor Kathy Hochul was pushing for Long Island suburbs to build more housing around train stations and be more transit-oriented, she cited Patchogue as a model. Unfortunately, my timing wasn't quite as transit-oriented. No, is that the train? <laughs> Just in time. So what are my thoughts on America's longest commuter rail service? It's hard to say. Because when I rode this train, I wasn't a commuter, nor was I following the typical travel pattern of one. For me and the many, many other people on the train after the South Fork, the Montauk branch was short-distance intercity rail and it didn't do a very good job of being that. I get that local travel provides the line with the bulk of its traffic year-round, and the existing setup and equipment support that well enough. But standing in a packed vestibule for a journey longer than three of Amtrak's routes was not fun. There needs to be something better on this route, because there's clearly demand for it. As much as I don't like standing in a crowded seat three, these crowds show that there is very much demand for more Montauk branch service. Communities on the South Fork rely on tourism, and the branch provides set tourism. The more people taking the train, the less people there are sitting in their cars in traffic, and that's an overall good thing for not just the environment, but also promoting transit as the way to go. So how can the MTA promote their trains? Well, during my ride to Montauk, I couldn't help but think of my trip on Boston's Cape Flyer the previous month. Both trains connect major metro areas to beach destinations with commuter equipment, and to take a similar amount of time to complete their journeys. But while the Montauk branch has significantly higher frequencies and speeds, the Cape Flyer has it beat for passenger comfort, with a bike car, a cafe car, and a limited first-class seating. You can tell that its visionaries wanted to create a pleasant experience to set it apart from standard commuter rail, and keep people coming back for more. Perhaps the state of New York should take some inspiration from them, to somehow make their summertime beach trains nicer, though I'm not sure what this would look like, or what would be done about the crowding. But all that said, I would still recommend a trip on the Montauk branch to any rail or transit van, just maybe in the spring or fall, since the lighthouse is closed in the winter. It's totally worth it for the views, and it's always a plus to have a friend along. Speaking of friends, now it's time for the face reveal of Mr. PenzyFan19. Like and subscribe! Hey Miles, you can't really say you went to Montauk in your Cross Long Island video without going to the lighthouse. Just saying.